Hey, what's up everybody? This is Pastor Ken and Tabitha. Hey! So glad you're tuning in today. I know that this message that you are about to watch right now has something on the inside of it that will transform your life. That is so true. God always has something to say whenever his word is going forth. So let's enjoy the word today. And so we want you to grab a pen, grab a notebook. Matter of fact, share this message with somebody else. Sit back and enjoy. Father God, thank you so much that all spirit comes from you, all truth comes from you. We ask that you would guide us into that truth at this time. Lord, fill my mouth with the words that you want me to speak. Take away anything that shouldn't be said today. Father, may all be said in accordance with your will and your glory. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, amen. All right, well, Wendy and I have been married as well for 20 years uh, this past August. We're actually coming up, coming up on 21 on August 8th, so we're excited about that. Uh, so we have been married for 20 years. We lived in Knoxville kind of during the first part of our marriage for a little while. Uh, so we were looking for our first home purchase together within the first five years of our marriage or so. So we drove around, looked over the area, found an area we kind of liked, and then we found this house. This house seemed too good to be true, right? And if it's too good to be true, it usually is, right? <laughs> yeah, so we found this house that seemed too good to be true. It was brand new construction. Um, it's a two-story house when you look at it from the front. So I feel like I probably need to explain something for, the, for my live audience here in Florida. They had these things when you get out of Florida, because Florida's pretty flat. They had these things when you get out of Florida, they're called hills, kind of like small mountains, right? So in Tennessee, there are a lot of hills. So the house we lived in was on a hill. The other thing I feel like I need to explain is we also had these things when you get out of Florida called basements. So <laughs> this house was on a hill and it had a basement. So when you look at it from the front, the front is facing kind of up the hill, it looks like two stories. You look at it from the back, because that's going down the hill, it's like three stories, right? The basement is kind of cut into that hill. So it's called a daylight basement, if you will. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the house. We thought it was a great house. We thought, man, we're buying it at such a good price. We could turn around and sell this thing in a few years, maybe make a little money, right? So that's our goal. So we lived there for about four years. The market in Knoxville turns, everything's looking great. We're like, let's kind of get our cash out of this, our equity out of this and sell the house. So we put it on the market, we get this great offer. I mean, we're gonna make money, this is looking great, right? And then, as you know, every offer is contingent upon an inspection. Right, right, so they had this inspector come out, he does this inspection of our house, he comes up with a report, sends it back to us, and all of a sudden they offer us this counter offer, which is significantly lower, matter of fact, has us just breaking even, not even making money. So we're, we're pretty upset about this. So I call a friend of mine that I go to church with, he's actually a structural engineer, and I call him up and say, hey, I'm not quite understanding this report. Can you, can you meet with me sometime, walk around my house and kind of explain this thing to me? So he does. He's spending some time, uh, comes and meets me at the house, walks around, looks at everything, spends about an hour. He says, okay, here's what's going on with your house. You've got two main problems. Number one is this back wall, which is made of concrete block, has been filled with concrete like it should be, has rebar running through it like it should, but then one of the things they do, they take that rebar, they bend it over at a 90 degree angle at the top, and they tie it into the concrete floor that they pour on top, right? So he was like, when, when they pour this foundation, this floor across the top for your garage, they bent the rebar over too far. So it's not at a 90 degree angle, it's too far. It's down in the sediment, not locking into that concrete. So that's problem number one. So your, your back wall is not really anchored from that top portion. Secondary problem is this, it rains a lot in East Tennessee. So with all the rain, with the tornadoes, with the things like that we would get, the rain was kind of working its way into that sediment, that gravel that's underneath that concrete, and it's weighing it down. And it's pushing that wall from the bottom. So you've got nothing anchoring it from the top, and it's being pushed from the bottom. So over time, over about four years, this wall has moved a good bit. I mean, it's, it's detaching from the house. So we've got a problem here. Long story short, the solution was this. There's a company, we've got them here in East Tennessee, but they basically take this thing called a helical pier. Yeah, I didn't know what it was either, don't worry. It's, it's kind of like a, a giant fan blade. So they take a block out, they insert it in, they expand the fan, and then they start cranking this thing in through the sediment until they reach earth. Then once they feel it locking into some dirt on the other side, they kind of wall back up the hole, they put a big bolt on the outside so they can keep cranking it, and then they tighten this thing until it's deep into the earth underneath. So it's pulling that back wall back into the house. So that was our fix. 
The thing is, it was a costly fix. So we, we basically broke even on the house, didn't make the money we had hoped to make in the first place, but it all came out in the end. But we learned an important lesson today, an important and expensive lesson. Foundations are important, right? Here's the thing. Just like our house had a foundation and we found some problems with it, you are building your life today. You're building your life on something. And the foundation you're building on is going to determine whether you weather the storms of life or whether everything comes crashing in on you. So I want to spend a few minutes today just kind of looking at this idea. Because storms are going to threaten your relationship. Storms are going to threaten your job. Storms are going to threaten your health. They're going to threaten your family. They may even threaten your faith. But what you've built on is going to determine how we respond to those. So I'm going to look at what, what to me was a familiar passage as I was planning for this. Um, I grew up in church, so I heard this story when I was just a little guy in Sunday school about this wise man that built on a rock and this foolish man that built on the sand, right? So I'd heard this story numerous times, and in the application, it kind of always went back to this idea of knowledge, of, of knowing more about God's Word, right? But as I dug into it, I was seeing something different that God was saying. So I kind of want to go with where the Holy Spirit's led me and what He's taught me this week. So if you would, let's look at this account. Now, it's recorded by two of Jesus' followers. The first is Matthew. And the second is the physician Luke. I want to start with, with Matthew's account. It's only a few, past, a few verses long. So look at it with me, if you would, on the screen. And Matthew writes this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So as I said earlier, the Holy Spirit was kind of leading me in this different idea, direction than I was originally wanting to go with this. It's not the idea of knowledge that we're seeing here. So let's look at it in Luke. I think it'll become a little more clear as we read the Luke passage. Luke 6, 46 to 49. It reads like this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. Let me read that to you again. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment that torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete." So I want to take Luke's passage and kind of break it down with you here, kind of verse by verse, if we could. So let's look at verse 46, 46, excuse me. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? So the first thing we're seeing is these were people who at least verbally recognized Jesus as Lord, right? They had come, they started following him. They were calling him Lord, at least verbally, correct? So we could say these were first century Christ followers. So he goes on, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So let's break it down this way. Why are you showing up to hear me teach and agreeing with me, but you're not living it out day by day? Why are you saying amen to the miracles? Why are you clapping when people are healed, but then you're going where you're going on Saturday night? You see, it's not in just following. It's not in just hearing that we lay the foundation. So go on to verse 46, 47. Excuse me. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words, and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. So I see three things here. This is what caught me off guard. Jesus says, for everyone who comes to me, who hears my words, and who puts them into practice. Here's the difference. We're going to get to a guy in a minute who built house on sand. And Jesus likens him very much to this guy, except for he didn't put the words into practice. That's the only difference. They both followed Christ the one put the words into practice, the ones didn't. It's in the doing. The foundation this morning is in the doing. So, verse 48. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. So, Jesus is saying, by taking action on my words, not just hearing it, but by living out what I'm telling you, your actions are building a foundation this morning. So, I think we can agree. Jesus is the rock that the wise man dug down deep and found. 
that he found, he sought out, he found Jesus. Now he's building a foundation by action on that rock. So let's look at the next verse, verse 48. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. So let me kind of put it this way. Jesus is saying, because in your business dealings, you chose to do the right thing and not cheat that person. You laid a foundation continually over time that I can bless your business because you responded to anger with kindness. You've laid down a foundation that I can bless you the next time someone responds to you the wrong way. Because you've given of your finances to God. You've laid down a foundation financially for yourself so that when hard times come, when the storms come, when the weather comes, not only can your finances be enough, they can be abundant. Because you obeyed your parents, I'm able to bless your life now. Because that obedience that you model with your parents is now obedience in following God. And when God calls you to do something, there's nothing that can stand against you. Amen? And finally, because you were faithful to your spouse, you laid down a foundation of faithfulness so that even the storms can't cause anything to happen to your marriage. Verse 49, let's see the contrast now. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice. Catch that phrase. The one who hears, he's still come, he's still followed, he's heard the words. The only difference is he did not put them into practice. He is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. So he's saying, every time you hear my words, and you choose not to act on them. Every time you hear my words, you hear my truth, and you choose to do something different, you're building still, but you're not building on a solid foundation. So Luke puts it this way, you're building without a foundation. Matthew said you're building on sand. Either way, it's not a good scenario, right? We live in Florida, there's a lot of sand here. If you just go out and start throwing up some boards, building a shack, It's just a matter of time before that thing gets blown over, right? We have hurricanes. We have all kinds of storms. So it's not going to last. It's not going to last the test of time. So in recapping all of this, as we've broken it down, I was looking at kind of the same Luke passage in another translation, the message translation, and I thought it really encapsulated everything we just talked about. So I'm going to put this on the screen. Read along with me, if you would. He says, why are you so polite with me? Always saying, yes, sir. And that's right, sir but never doing a thing, I tell you. These words I speak to you are not mere additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundation words to build a life on. If you work the words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who dug deep and laid the foundation of his house on bedrock. When the river burst its banks and crashed against the house, nothing could shake it. It was built to last. But if you just use my words, listen to this part. If you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a dumb carpenter who built a house but skipped the foundation. When the swollen river came crashing in, it collapsed like a house of cards. It was a total loss. You know, I hope, I hope I've made it clear today that you're, you're building something with your life, whether you want to or not, whether you have a strong foundation or not. You're building something just by the actions that you lay down every day, one right on top of the other. You're building something. And we need a foundation so that our life can stand the test of times. So I want to give you three takeaways this morning. And we're going to pull all of these from Luke 647. So that should be coming up on the screen for you. It reads like this. For everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. These are our three takeaways. For everyone who comes to me, who hears my words, and puts them into practice. Now, each of these takeaways is going to apply to someone different here today. So we'll break that down. So the first group I want to address is for those of you that are kind of like me. Maybe you've been a Christ follower for a while. You've already come to Jesus. You've heard his words for quite a while. You know what he says. Matter of fact, that sin that you struggle with, you could probably take me to the exact passage that you need to stand on, to stand firm against that sin. You you know what this word says. Your takeaway today is at the end of that verse, put them into practice. That's what you need to do. You need to start acting. You need to start building a foundation. Let me illustrate it this way. I, um, I enjoy running to kind of stay in shape, right? And I know that hits some of you kind of sideways. You, you like to run, wait, I'm not running unless someone's chasing me, okay? But no, I actually enjoy running. 
especially getting up in the morning and, and running. So um, it's one of the things I do to kind of just stay in shape. So I'll run a mile or two about every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday right now. So, uh, but a year ago, we bought a house here in Gainesville, and I got kind of out of my practice, okay? I'll be honest with you. We had a lot of projects that had to happen around the house. We had floors that need to be replaced. We had walls that need to be painted, all these things that I had to do. So it was kind of eating up a lot of my time, so I stopped running. So getting me a year into not running, and I'm feeling kind of sluggish. I'm just not feeling the energy that I used to have. So I told Wendy, I need to get back out there and start running, right? So that's my goal. About a month ago, I get out of bed. I'm like, I just got to do this. So I go over to Depot Park, and I start running. So I'm out there this past Saturday, a week ago. Not yesterday, but a week ago. I'm out there with my oldest son, Ethan. And we uh, go out to run a mile or two. And there's this lady out there. She's the only person there at 6.30 in the morning. It's pretty early, right? She's the only person there. She's putting up these signs, like these banners, with flags all over it. And she says, hey, are you here for park run? And I was like, well, I don't know what park run is. I'm here to run the park. But yeah, go ahead. Tell me about Park Run. So she tells me Park Run is this organization that is worldwide, and if there's not a 5K in your area, it's a free 5K. You can start one wherever you are. So there's one in Gainesville. Happens at Depot Park every Saturday at 7:30. So if you need to get in shape like me, go there. Okay, they'll help you. But here's the thing: I can wake up every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, put on my running shoes, put on my shorts, eat my breakfast, and just go about my day. Now I look like a runner all day long, right? but I haven't started laying a foundation to running a 5K because I know I'm not ready yet to run a 5K. I got to work up to that, right? I'm only running like a mile or so. So I got to work toward it. So I tell Ethan, let's work toward that, okay? So I've got to start doing something. I can't just look the part. So I can even get up. I can put on my shorts. I can put on my shoes. I can go stand in front of my mirror and say, you are the best runner. You can run a 5K. You've got this. Yeah. And if I never put my feet on the ground and run, I haven't done anything. I know what to do. I've got the gear. I've got the energy. I've got the confidence. But if I never take my foot out and put it on a track and start running, I'm not laying a foundation to run a 5K. So I've got to get off my couch and start running. That's the answer, right? So for some of you today, you need to start taking these things that you know and actually living them out. That's the thing that hit me. We've got to live it out. Now, I know some of you probably don't connect to running, so let me, let me see if I can give you another illustration to kind of drive home the point. So there was this movie that came out a few years back um, called The Karate Kid. Anybody seen that? Yeah, yeah. Like OG, like Ralph Macchio as Daniel, Pat Morita as, as Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, that's what we're talking about here, yeah. So Daniel is this guy. He's in high school. He kind of gets in this scuffle with this guy at a, at a school, something like that. Mr. Miyagi, though, he sees this guy from Okinawa, Mr. Miyagi, practicing these martial arts. And he says, hey, could you show me some of that? Could you teach me? And Mr. Miyagi's like, yeah, sure. Just come over tomorrow morning, and we'll start. So you know how the story goes, right? Daniel shows up the next day. He's like, hey, I'm here. I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's, let's do some karate, right? Mr. Miyagi's like, okay, come with me. Takes him out to the back of his house. He has this expansive deck out there. And he says, Daniel, I need you to sand the deck. So Daniel gets down. You, you know how this goes, right? He starts sanding the deck haphazardly. Mr. Miyagi's like, no, 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 no. Sand on. Send off. <laughs> so Daniel spends all day sanding on, sending off, right? So he spends all day sanding this deck. At the end of the day, he gets up, his back's hurting him, right? He goes back to Mr. Miyagi. Okay, I'll sand your deck. Come back tomorrow. So Daniel comes back the next day. Mr. Miyagi's got this line of classic cars that have not seen any attention in a long time, right? And he says, I need you to wax my cars. So Daniel starts haphazardly waxing them. He's like, no, no, Daniel, wax on, wax off. So Daniel starts waxing the cars, right? Waxing on, waxing off. One at a time. He gets through this entire line of cars. And then Mr. Miyagi says, come back the next day. So he comes back the next day. Mr. Miyagi has this fence, and he says, Daniel, son, paint the fence. And Daniel's like, okay. He just starts slapping paint up there. And he's like, no, 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 no. Paint the fence. Up, down, up, down. So Daniel paints the fence. Up and down, up and down, right? So Daniel finally hits this tipping point, if you remember. And he says, hey, I'm doing all these chores for you. When are you going to start teaching me karate, Right? So Mr. Miyagi gets kind of stern with him and looks at him and says, Daniel, son, paint the fence. So Daniel like, does like this kind of haphazardly. He's like, no, 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 paint the fence. So Daniel throws his arm up. And as he does, Mr. Miyagi throws a punch, and it blocks it in perfect time. Then Mr. Miyagi says, Daniel, son, sand the floor. So he sands, and Mr. Miyagi throws a kick, and he blocks it just in time. 
And he keeps calling out commands, do this, do that. Daniel does them all. And he starts to realize everything I just did, all these chores laid a foundation for me to know karate. So here's the point in that. Sanding a floor is not glamorous, right? Waxing cars is not glamorous. Painting a fence is not glamorous. The doing is usually not glamorous. We can celebrate the end result. We can celebrate Pastor Ken and Pastor Tabitha this morning for 20 years of marriage. Rightfully so. That's right. You can clap for that. That's good. Yes. But they built that 20-year marriage on a daily doing of a foundation. They built a foundation over time by choosing to do the right thing on a daily basis. That's good. So let's look back at verse 47 from Luke. Your takeaway today, if you were like me, is to start doing, right? However, there's another group here today, and I want to speak to you right now. You may be newer to following Jesus. You may say to yourself, hey, I, I just need to learn more. I've been following Christ for you know, a couple years now, I don't feel like I know enough. Or maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I really feel called to ministry. I feel like God's calling me to do something more with my life at this point. I want to speak to you at this point. So let's look at our verse, Luke 40, 6, 47. For everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. So the second takeaway today is hear my words. Some of us need to hear a little more of God's words. You can't take action on something you don't know. So we need to get in community so that we can learn more about what God has to say. So I wanna give you some very practical steps this morning on what you can do to hear his words so that you can act on them. Number one is just simply this. Pastor Ken mentioned it earlier, the first 15. If you're not doing that already, start implementing the first 15 at the beginning of your day. I would encourage you. It's gonna change your day as you go through it. That's five minutes of Bible reading, five minutes of prayer, Five minutes of worship. If you say, Stephen, I'm already doing that, then you can take it to the next level if you haven't already. Go to Growth Track. It's gonna be right after this service. There are gonna be people right out here in this courtyard holding up signs, smiling at you, saying, Growth Track starts now. Know God is our topic today. I would encourage you, spend the four weeks there. Get a foundation for your faith if you don't have one already. The next step would be a fresh start group if you've done Growth Track. It is 10 weeks of foundational truth, just like we're talking about today, foundations. It's gonna give you how to pray, who the Holy Spirit is, who God is, who man is, what the Bible says about worship, all these topics from some of our pastors or from pastors of like-minded churches, teaching us the foundations of God's word. Beyond that is an alive group. So you can get plugged into one of those. We have married groups, we have single groups, but I would encourage you, get into one. Some of you today, you say, well, I've been in alive groups for quite a while now. You need to lead a group, okay? You need to step up and start doing, like we talked about in that first step. Not just hearing, but doing. And then finally, I would encourage you, if you're not on the dream team, find a place you can get plugged in. The final one is this. If you say, hey, I'm really interested in, in probably pursuing a life in ministry. We offer here our uh, degreed and non-degreed programs through a live leadership institute. Now, as the assistant campus pastor, one of my roles will be to oversee that. So I have kind of a vested interest there. So if you need to know more about that, come talk to me after the service. I'd love to talk with you a little more about what these programs look like. But like I said, we have a degreed program. That's gonna earn you a 40-year degree if you want to through Southeastern University. It can be done during the daytime or it can be done at night. We also have our Alive Leadership Institute non-degree track, which will get you a certificate. It's only done on Monday night. So if you say, I've already got a job or I've already got a degree, um, but I wanna know more about God's word. I'm hungry for God's word and I wanna be used by God more. That's a great way for you to start. So I would encourage you to look, to talk to me about that. I'd love to hook you up with some information there. Um, the one thing, though, that I want to point out that all of these have in common, with the exception of the first 15, is this, community. Yeah. You need community in your walk. Why? For accountability. Just like on Saturdays. Some Saturdays, I really don't feel like running, okay? I will be honest with you. Matter of fact, Tuesdays and Thursdays, oftentimes, I don't feel like running. But here's the thing. I know I've got a son who runs with me, and if I don't get up, he's going to come knocking on my door. Hey, Dad, we run it today? Yeah. Built-in accountability. Amen. So I know, yes, let's get up and run. If you fall, you've got someone there to help pick you up. That's important. And I'm going to say this as nice as I can this morning. Some of you just need better friends, okay? 
You need to get in the right kind of community. Because just like Pastor Aaron talked about, he came from a background where he was trying to get away from it. So he moved to Gainesville, thinking he could get away from it. And the first night he went out, he found himself with those same people. So he had to choose better friends. And he met Ben, who's on our worship team, and got plugged in here. So I'd encourage you, get some good, not just community, some good community into your life. Amen? So I would encourage you, if that's you today, hear the words. Get in community to help you hear and do those. Um, I mentioned that wall of our house earlier, how it was kind of drifting away down the hill. Some of you today, you may have had a foundation. You may have grown up in church. You may have heard a lot of these words. You had a good start, a good foundation, but over time, you have started drifting away from God. Just like they were able to take that helical pier device and kind of tie that back wall back into our house by digging deep to a foundation, that's what you need this morning. You need community in your life to help anchor you into a house. Just like that wall needed to be re-anchored back to our house, you need to be re-anchored back to God's house. You've drifted away. So I would encourage you, seek out community. We're here to help you. The final takeaway is this, and it's, it's found in the first few words of Luke 6, 47. It's for everyone who comes to me. You see, for some of you, your takeaway this morning is to actually start a relationship with Jesus. You can't hear and act on the word until you take the first step. You can't build a solid foundation for your life until you start with that rock, the rock of Jesus. You know, Matthew, Matthew mentioned that the house was built on sand. That sand represents something. It represents the shifting instability of life. And as long as you try to do it without Jesus, it's always going to be unstable. You may say, well, I'm, I'm reading all these self-help books to help me. I'm, I'm trying to seek this counsel. I'm looking into this. All of those things are going to be unstable unless you build on the rock of Jesus. That's where you need to set your foundation this morning. So I want to explain what Jesus did for us real quick. Because some of you, this is your step today. You see, Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He lived a sinless perfect life, something you and I could not do. And even in that, he chose to be nailed to a cross for your wrongdoings, for your sins, and for mine. And in doing so, he didn't stay on that cross. He rose again the third day, conquering death and hell, making a way for us to be made right with the Father. That's your step today, to simply come and say, I accept what you did for me. So I want to give you that chance at this time. If you would, every head bowed and every eye closed. And I want to ask, is there one today who would say, that's me, Stephen? I realize today that I need to make that decision to come. If you would, just raise your hand at this time. Amen. I see that hand. I see that hand. Is there another? You're on the fence. You know you need to raise that hand but you're just not sure. Jesus is waiting. He says, come to me. Thank you for that hand. Yes. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. And it's not the prayer itself that saves you. It's the belief in what Jesus did for you this morning. So as we've got our heads bowed, our eyes closed, would you repeat these words after me? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your only son to die on a cross for me. I accept what you did in my place. I accept you as Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Save me. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you made that decision this morning, you are now on your way to a relationship with Jesus. I pray that that message blessed you today. I know for me, God's word changed me. It changed me, it helped me overcome years of depression, sexual abuse, even poverty. And I just know that God's word is changing something for the better inside of you. Yeah, if this message today has blessed you in any way, you know the greatest compliment that you could ever give us would be to share this with someone else. You know, when I go out to a great restaurant, I don't wanna keep it to myself. I want the world to know you gotta go here to get that fried chicken and them sweet potatoes, <laughs> And so if this has been good groceries for you, if it's been good food, if it's been life transformation for you, do us a favor, share it with a friend, comment below, make sure that you subscribe to our channel today, and we hope we'll see you again real soon. God bless you. We'll see you soon.